Hello, I'm Christopher Tarantola, and today on part two of Mars Talk, episode eight, we are going to cover um, all the honorable mention news that we didn't cover last week. Mars Society San Diego, a chapter highlight, as well as our feature segment, um, we're going to have Jerry here talk about his Mars movies. Um, now, make sure you go to www.marstalk.org for all the latest episodes, social media, and links to everything in this episode and all of our episodes. And of course, joining me today is uh, Jerry Williams once again. Jerry uh, grew up during the space race. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Physics with a minor in Astronomy from the University of Utah. He is a filmmaker with 16 feature films as cinematographer under his belt. And he works under his company, Williams Production Company. Uh, welcome back, Jerry. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we had a really great discussion last time. Uh, this time we're going to go into a little bit more depth about what you do. Okay. Uh, but before we get there, we are just going to kind of do what we call the lightning round, where we're just going to go through all the news that's been happening to so make sure people know what's going on in the world of space. We're going to have links to all of these uh, stories if you want to learn more about them on MarsTalk.org. Um, if you have something to say, go ahead and say it. If not, we can just keep on rolling and try and get through this pretty quick. Sounds good. Um, first story, Firefly Aerospace announced it plans to work with the Israel, uh, I'm sorry, the Israel Aerospace Industries to develop its own lunar landers for NASA. IAI is the manufacturer of the Bereshit lunar lander that uh, uh, Israel sent a couple of months ago. So um, that's exciting news. Um, try and get to that next step. Um, several companies win NASA funds to study moon landers. Uh, this includes SpaceX, Blue Origin, Maston Space, Sierra Nevada Corporation, Boeing, and of course Lockheed Martin, among others. Um, and so all these companies, they, they've been given some funds to be able to develop uh, lunar landers, uh, a very important part of the Artemis program moving forward. And I think uh, regardless of how Artemis turns out, this will be all good stuff um, having these guys do that. China's Mars rover has completed construction and is slated to launch next year in July or August. Uh, so that's actually, uh, I was a little bit surprised just because I haven't been following it as closely, but that means that we're going to have Mars 2020, we're going to have the ESA's uh, Mars uh, 2020 rover as well. Yes. And China's... And an orbiter. And also you're going to have uh, United Arab Emirates, their Hope mission. Really, I don't. I haven't learned too much about it. I, I've been remiss. I'm, I'm there is a. The job. If you go onto YouTube, look up Mars 2020 Springtime, and watch okay. the video there. Well, we'll we'll I'll find it and I'll put a link in the description um, as well. All right. Um, well, SpaceX and Blue Origin win battle on the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill, here in the United States, regarding uh, fairing contractors. Um, there's been a battle between um, ULA and Northrop Grumman and SpaceX and Blue Origin to get um, these contractors to work with them because uh, uh, Northrop Grumman and ULA have tried to use their clout on Capitol Hill um, uh, lobbying to try and ice out the other two uh, up and comers with uh, having legislation that basically created exclusivity. Um, so I think that is, it's a good thing that it didn't, it, it has failed what they've been trying to do. Obviously, uh, not surprising or anything new, uh, to see the old battling against the new. That's exactly what it is. Old space versus new space. There you go. Um, in some somewhat disappointing news, uh, air and space, uh, Vega launched failed on July 10th. Um, they lost a, a Emirati satellite. Uh, showing once again, as we always hear when one of these events happen, space is hard. Um, it's getting easier, at least it's getting more uh, common, but it's, it's still, you know, there's a lot that can go wrong. And it's the first failure for Vega, but, um, you know, it happens. So, Japan's JAXA probe, Hayabusa 2, touched down on Raigu. So, they got um, some really cool photos that... Uh, the probe actually went down. It's a very small little asteroid. And so they were able to touch down. And when they touched down, you could see the rocks actually like all around it 
came up because the gravity is so low, kind of weird looking. Very this is the counter- second time. This is the second indeed. time they've touched down. Indeed, indeed. You are absolutely correct on that. So uh, congratulations to them on that. Exciting stuff. Dynetics uh, joins up with Maxar on the power and propulsion element for the Artemis Gateway. So Maxar, if you remember, was awarded the contract by NASA a couple months ago. So Dynetics is a, another company, and they're joining forces with Maxar to complete that contract. Um, Roscosmos uh, successfully launches the Spectre RG X-ray Astronomy Observatory on July 13th on a proton rocket. So that, that went off without a hitch, and that's pretty exciting because we're going to get some more uh, astronomical observ- observations with this new X-ray telescope, uh, which I'm excited to see. Um, so much spectrum out there to, to look at the universe with. So, China's Tiangong, I hope I said that correctly, <laughs> Um, uh, but I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, China's Tiangong yeah. 2 space lab performed a 57 meters per second burn, uh, lowering its periapsis to 188 kilometers, um, basically making its orbit closer to the Earth. Um, and that's in preparation for a second burn that will happen, um, I think, on July 18th. It actually already happened. Yes. Yeah. That's when the, the, the burn that I'm talking about happened. They're going to be doing another burn shortly where it'll deorbit. Um, the Actually, it, it has already deorbited. Oh, it has it already? Yeah, just there the past go. day or so. It uh, deorbited into the South Pacific. There you go. So uh, that, that has been deorbited, and that's in preparation because they're going to have their new uh, China space station up there in a couple, uh, in a year or two. At least that's the plan. Um, SpaceX ran a firing test in Boca Chica, Texas on July 16th of the Raptor engines, which they have installed on their Starhopper Starhopper prototype. Um, After the test, Elon tweeted and spoke out about plans to have Starship and Super Heavy flying within two to three months and landing on the moon within as little as two years. Uh, We do got to account for Elon time there, I think, a little bit, but that's still pretty impressive. Excuse me. Um, it may be easier to land Starship on the moon than convince NASA that we can land Starship on the moon. Um, that's a, a quote from Elon, I think, to Time Magazine, or at least Time, it's not a magazine anymore, but um, they had an interview with him, and he also did a, a segment with CBS uh, as part of the 50th anniversary celebration. Um, so he's kind of been uh, really pushing forward with this. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the, the last part of uh, that came out last week. Yes. Um, moving to the next story here, India, uh, they have launched Chandrayaan, <laughs> Chandrayaan. I don't know. Uh, forgive my forgive my pronunciation. Chandrayaan two on the GLS V Mark three dash M one on July twenty third. Um, so this is a lunar landing robotic mission. Um, it is set, set to land on the moon later, uh, much later, because they're taking a very um, fuel efficient, so they're going to orbit the Earth several times, pushing out the apoapsis, which is the, the furthest point from the Earth, um, until they get to a point where that will put it into lunar transfer orbit, and then they're going to de-orbit and lower that high point around the moon, until they eventually land on the moon. So they're going to take a It's going to take route. seven weeks to do that. Indeed. So, and they're uh, going to land on the southern polar region near the South Pole. So we should get some nice horizon shots. Going. Yeah, we're going to get some nice horizon shots with the Earth hanging there. That's going to be great. So, and, and that's pretty cool. Uh, actually, I saw, I don't have this in my list here today, but I saw this morning uh, trolling through th- Twitter that. China has made overtures to India to try and join up their their programs to get to the moon faster. So that was also an interesting development, considering this launch just happened. So we'll see what goes on there. Uh, probably the, the the saddest news, the most somber news mm-hmm. that we have uh, for this episode, uh, Christopher Kraft, uh, NASA's first flight director, uh, died yesterday as far as uh, from this recording um, it would have been a 
about a week and a half from the time that this video was released. Um, but he, uh, to, to, for those that may not know, and I, I think most people in space, the space industry know, but uh, he was the first flight director. Uh, he was flight director on Mercury 3, which was America's first crewed space flight. Mercury 6, America's first crewed orbital flight. And Gemini 4, uh, which was America's first spacewalk. He was pretty much the person responsible for creating the, um, and, and it was no one person, but he more than I think anybody else, for the procedures and the, the, the structure of how we have a mission control in Houston um, whenever there's a, a space flight. Um, and he, did, he went on to, to be in administration at NASA for, till I think, 1982. Um, is a very huge part of all the accomplishments uh, of the Apollo era and, and beyond. Um, and so he is very much missed and uh, at least he got to, to, he just barely, hopefully he got to celebrate a little bit yeah. of his anniversary. I got to meet him uh, at the San Diego and Space Museum back for the 40th anniversary of Apollo 8. How cool. He was a very charming fellow. Uh, I'd never, I obviously got to meet him, but certainly I've heard about him, been in the, the building named after him uh, there in Houston. So um, he will be missed. Well, let's move on. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Mars Society San Diego. So um, Jerry uh, here, you are um, part of this chapter. Um, yeah, I'm one of the original co-founders. There you go. Uh, so what I was about to ask is, tell us a little bit about how the chapter got started, how you got involved, and, um, you know, what is the chapter set up like? Is it part of a university? Is it a nonprofit organization? Or, or how? what kind of structure do you all have? Uh, well, Mars San Diego, or Mars Society Chapter San Diego, uh, started in 2001. Uh, it was formed by Andrew Solomon, who came off of a Mars Society conference the previous year, mm -hmm. and uh, with the task given to him by Zubrin to start a San Diego chapter. Uh, this is pretty young in the Mars Society, right? Because Mars Society, yeah. I think, was 98? Yeah, so this was 2001. The convention, I guess, was 2000. So 2001 in February, they had their first meeting at an Acapulco restaurant where, we, where they ate a lot of good Mexican food, which is San Diego is known for. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't find out about it until about a month later because I was researching a film I was writing that takes place on Mars and around uh, the asteroid belt. Okay. And uh, so I stumbled upon this link to the Mars Society. And I saw that and I said, hey, this is kind of cool. So I looked at it, got Robert Zubrin's book, The Case for Mars, The Plan to Settle the Red Planet, Why We Must. I read it and said, hey, I can buy into this. You know, we can get, uh, we can go to Mars and we don't really need NASA to be the only way to get there. Yeah. So I found out that there was a new chapter in San Diego. I went to the second meeting uh, and uh, there were like, six people there. Mm -hmm. Shannon Rupert, who runs the Mars Desert Research Station, she was one of those members. Groff Bittner, Jonathan Butler. Uh, oh, well, don't get old, your memory goes. Uh, but, but we... <laughs> Happens we to the were, best of us. Yeah, exactly. We were enjoying uh, just meeting at Acapulco Restaurant, getting fat on Mexican food. And uh, so we just kind of, that was our, the way we were doing things for a couple of months. And then I used to run publicity for Comic-Con back in the 80s, 83, oh, wow. 85. Yeah. And uh, Comic-Con was coming up. And I said, you know, we should do something other than just have these once a, once a month meetings where we eat Mexican food. So let's put a panel together for Comic-Con. Let's put a display table together for Comic-Con. And we did uh, both those things. And it gelled us as an organization. We were getting more people together by then. We actually got a lot of people out of that Comic-Con panel because we had NASA folk there. 
-hmm. had people from Malin Space Science Systems who run the cameras on Mars. Uh, we had uh, some science fiction authors. We had some science fiction media people. And we had this hour and a half long program where we got to bring Mars to the audience and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got a big boost of people out after that. So we started having uh, more events. We started doing public outreach where we'd get together and go to universities and colleges and libraries and museums and we do Mars talks. Uh, hey, I've heard of that before. Mars talks. Yeah, Mars <laughs> talk. Good plug. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to elbow that in there. Exactly. So November rolls around in 2001 and we decide, hey, we need to kind of have a social night where we just get together and do nothing. So I said, okay. Going look, back to the Mexican food. Yeah, not this outside the Mexican food. So I just said, you know, hey, I've got to my studio where I do my photography and my video. Uh, I've got a 10 foot wide screen. Uh, I've got a surround system. I've got DVD player, VHS player, whatever you want. Uh, I can hook in the computer. So let's have a Mars movie night. And I can do this like once a month. So we put together a Mars movie night for I think, uh, don't remember the exact date now, I can look it up, mm -hmm. but we showed Total Recall. Yeah, classic. And that was a blast. So the next month we did Robinson Crusoe on Mars. And uh, after having to restart it four times because people kept coming in late, I started putting trailers in front of that. So give people <laughs> the time to come in. But it went on from there. And with a few exceptions, uh, We've been running Mars movie nights uh, since November of 2001. Wow. Yeah. Last, really month cool. we, last month we just showed, uh, actually it was this month we showed uh, My Favorite Martian, the movie. We showed Rocket Man, two Disney films that were really of a slapstick humor yeah. kind of yeah. stage. And one of the things I also do is I've been showing uh, an episode each Mars movie night of the original My Favorite Martian TV series. Okay. <laughs> so it had pretty good turnout. I can put 15 people in here comfortably, 22 people when, you know, we're doing big events. Uh, but we do this every single month. People bring food, uh, drinks, whatever. And we kind of share it. Somebody goes up to the local cheapy pizza place and brings yeah. pizza for everybody. Yeah. So it's a it's a really fun event, and uh, we've been, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And and y'all after after the movies, you were telling me y'all kick it around, you know, just talk and hang out. Oh, absolutely. During the intermissions too, because it takes you know everybody has to go out and they've been drinking all this Coca Cola <laughs> and whatever. Uh, they have to go out and get rid of that and before coming back to the next film. So we definitely discuss it. A lot of times, depending on the movie, we'll, we'll do a Mystery Science Theater 3000 type thing <laughs> where we all just are commenting over the top of the movie <laughs> because it's so bad. Yeah. And 90% of the Mars movies are bad. So, I, 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 I could imagine there's a lot of bad sci-fi out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we kept you know, I kept buying Mars movies. We kept adding them up. And I said, you know, I really should kind of catalog uh, all the Mars movies that are out there, what we can do, what we've got. And so that became the MarsMovieGuide.com. It's a website that I just started putting. It's nothing but a big list right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that'll change in the future when I get a little more web savvy. But I've been getting on you to, to maybe uh, do a Marspedia article. Uh, we could probably do that, but this shelf behind me mm -hmm. is nothing but Mars movies that wow. I've collected over the years. So I have the world, the Earth's largest collection of Mars movies. There you go. And uh, I'm kind of proud about that, and we'll see what happens. I've got stuff that very few people have. Uh, one of the films that I just collected was uh, that I've been looking for for a long time, like 15 years I've been looking for this film. It was a made-for-TV movie from 
1999, I believe, called Special Report, Journey to Mars, with Alfred Woodward, Keith Carradine, Judd Reinhold. It, is it a documentary uh, or is it like a movie? No. Well, it, it wasn't a documentary. It was more like uh, one of those you are there kind of TV episodes where Alfred Woodward is a news commentator mm -hmm. and she's hosting this landing of the first manned Mars mission. Okay. You know, so it's like kind of a CNN type situation where they're taking you live and direct to the surface of mars gotcha yeah that's, and that's... uh so you see this made? Uh, i believe it was 1999 okay and uh it was shown only once it got really lousy ratings because they screened it opposite the academy awards <laughs> okay it was never seen again i think there was a vhs release of it but i've never ever been able to get my uh, hands on a copy of that. So what happened there was, uh, I was talking to my friend about this just earlier this year, actually. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, we should try this weird place that has a lot of VHS tapes called Grumpy Bob's Emporium and Lawnmower Repair. <laughs> They're out in the uh, Midwest somewhere. And uh, so he contacted Bumpy, Grumpy Bob for me because he had a connection there. Uh, turns out Grumpy Bob didn't have it, so Dave went to Internet Movie Database and started looking down the list of the people who made the film and found out that he went to school, he went to high school with the executive producer. Oh, wow. Small world. And he just ran into the executive producer at a high school reunion a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. So he called on my behalf. He called the guy and... Uh, the guy went out and pulled his master tapes and burnt me probably the only existing DVD copy of that film and sent it to okay. Dave. He looked at it and sent it to me. Now it's in my collection back here. So that was really exciting. So I got to screen that in front of a, an audience finally. And I'm probably going to take that film to the Mars Society Conference this year. Okay. So, so that, we were talking about that. Um, exactly. Well, we'll, so it was a lot of fun. I mean, so the Mars Society right these days is probably not too much more than my Mars movie night in San Diego. Uh, Y'all aren't going to Comic-Con and doing those types of things anymore? Or? Oh, no. We stopped that in 2009 when we got bumped up to the mezzanine level. We used to have a table down on the main floor, which was great. Everybody saw us. The mezzanine is in the back yeah. uh, at a halfway level, and mm -hmm. it's where they put all the, the fan tables. And it gets maybe a tenth of the tr foot traffic. Got so it. we decided, you know, it just isn't worth it anymore. Plus, most of the time that we've had the Mars Society San Diego chapter, you have people coming, staying for a while, then they get a job out of state or they go on to something else. That happens a lot. So we get a lot of ebb and flow. And then around 2009, we kind of combined the Mars Society chapter with the San Diego Space Society because we had like an 85% membership overlap. Mm -hmm. And so they had the Space Travelers Emporium down in North Park, which was cool. Mm -hmm. A place that we actually got to go out and uh, teach laboratory. They had a space activity laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, they had events there. They had other things. But we made use of that. Uh, we got involved with Space Up, which is an unconference that originated here in San Diego, that's now moved worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while there, we got to, uh, we would build our own Mars rovers. You know, Mars rover, Mars exploration rover Spirit and Opportunity were big at the time. You know, they landed in 2004. Yeah. Uh, Opportunity just died this last year. Yeah, we but recovered that. They were big in the media. Uh, because they're rovers, they had a personality, so everybody knew about them. They were, you know, little media darlings. So we decided, yeah. we went out and bought a Radio Shack truck, an RC truck. Yeah. Stripped the truck off it, the chassis off of it, and built a Mars rover chassis that looked like one of the Mars Exploration rovers. How cool. <clears throat> yeah, it was. And we put a wireless video camera on board that would send a signal of what the rover was seeing to either a monitor or a projection or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
and we would let the kids drive the rover, but they couldn't look at the rover and drive it. They had to look at the video screen and drive the rover that way. So it yeah. really got a little bit of that telepresence operating going on. And we did that for probably, oh geez, six or eight years. Now, Radio Shack trucks are not the most sturdy. They're cheap. <laughs> They're only available during Christmas. So it was uh, difficult to keep them operational. You know, we kept taking that chassis we built, dropping it on different rover bodies as uh, the rovers gave out. We never had the wherewithal to go out and have a professional, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a hobby scale rover yeah. built for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we would take those uh, rovers to museums, to libraries, to schools. Uh, because I'm a filmmaker, I have a lot of available time between mm -hmm. jobs. Uh, so I was taking those all over the place and doing a lot of Mars outreach. I still do a lot of Mars outreach, just... Uh, so what kind of things? Well, earlier this month, so I hooked up with OASIS, which is a continuing education program for people over 50. Mm -hmm. And I went out and gave them my, one of my lectures that I do at a lot of those little local sci-fi conventions. It's called Invasion from Earth, the Robotic Exploration of the Red Planet Mars. So we go through all eight spacecraft that are at Mars, and we have the latest imagery from that spacecraft, a latest update on what's going on. I kept updating that program like every two or three months as I get uh, gigs. I've also got several other different uh, Mars related programs that I go out to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Oasis is talking to me now about doing one uh, called Roving the Red Planet with Curiosity. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll do one on the rover there. I've got What's Up on Mars, which basically just orients people to what Mars is all about. Yeah. You know, and it, it's no longer just a, a concept of this little red dot in the sky or this, this thing you hear about, but you don't know. It's a physical place. We have pictures. We have data well, coming back. The whole thing is mapped, that. right? With the, yeah. the reconnaissance orbiter and... Yeah, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. You had the Mars Global Surveyor before that and uh, the Vikings before that. So there's just so much stuff going on. Uh, one of the other programs I do is I take Robert Zubrin's documentary, The Mars Underground. Yeah. I take it out and I show it to people. And uh, then I do a question and answer after that. Uh, I also do a uh, one on the Mars Desert Research Station called uh what's it called it's been a while since i've done that one uh space pioneers in the utah no i can't remember what it's called i'll have to find it but we go through each season i put together a retrospective of what they did at the mars desert research station right okay. and I, and i just kind of walk people through that and then i tell them too that look if you've got two weeks of your time and you want to go on a Mars vacation, let me know, I'll put you in contact with the people and we'll send you to Mars for two weeks and you can be part of the Mars crew. It's really cool. It is. So that, that's that been some fun stuff. I've been following that. One of the early programs we did with the Mars Society chapter here in San Diego was we were mission support for MDRS crew 1B, 2, 3, 4, and a handful of others in the very beginning. Oh, cool. So we would get to all the reports that come down would come to us. We mm -hmm. would have to edit them, comment on them, distribute them, send them back uh, to the Mars Society website. And uh, it really made us feel that we were, you know, part of something big there. And a lot of that's still going on and there's still a lot of need for that kind of things. I don't, I'm not actively participating in that now because of some health issues, but I still ghost on the Capcom channel for the MDRS. And, uh, you know, in addition to the MDRS, there's also the FMARS up in the Canadian Arctic. Yeah. And for a while there was uh, a couple of 
expeditions to the Australian outback. And uh, there were plans for an Iceland uh, research station that was actually built and apparently it got damaged in shipping over to England before they shipped it up to Iceland. So they ended up having to sell it for scrap metal, which was really right. sad. But uh, the MDRS is still a very active thing and we do that. Plus I've talked to people about the university rover challenge going at the, the MDRS campus too. You know, there's just so much episode, happening. We're going to have um, the folks that run the university rover challenge as well as the European rover challenge. Oh, that's coming cool. on. And they're going to tell us all about that. Uh, that's coming up August 5th, I believe. Yeah. Well, that's what's really been exciting to me was watching the Mars Society chapters across the globe. You know, there's even a Mars Society chapter in Antarctica. How yep. cool is that? You know, all seven, yeah, all seven continents. But uh, watching the things that the others are doing. The Mars Society chapter in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, they were, I was talking to them quite a bit because they wanted to do the Mars rover situation like we did. So I was giving them all my tips and tricks and, you know, blueprints and everything. And they kind of came up with their own rover. And they had a Mars yard that they were running the rover around in. And uh, it, it's just great watching that stuff kind of propagate out. Indeed. Yeah. But the last couple of years, because I've had some major health issues, uh, it's kind of the Mars Society chapter is kind of whittled down a little bit to where we've got maybe six active people on a regular basis. And right now, the only activity besides occasional outreach is uh, doing my Mars movie nights here. All right, so we got to start working on getting uh, your successor going, huh? Exactly. I would love to come in and have somebody kind of, you know, take over for me, keep it running. I'll keep doing my Mars movies. Uh, I'll come in and help where I can. And uh, I do have a nice little studio space that we have used for meetings in the past and can continue to do that. So. Well, I, um, I wish y'all luck there. Um, Thank you. Now, you talked a lot about your Mars movies, but, um, you know, <laughs> do you have, like, because it's kind of one and the same in that you're, you're showing them during, uh, as part of your chapter, do yeah. you do any other work with that outside of that? How do you mean? So, um, do you do any work regarding Mars movies that's not really part of the Mars Society chapter? Um, I have a multimedia program called A Century of Mars in the Movies mm -hmm. that I, I take around to different places. Uh, the problem is it's gotten so big that I've actually had to break it into two parts. You know, yeah. so we have uh, Mars in the Movies from the 1910 Thomas Edison's A Trip to Mars which is a four minute home kinetoscope film that I have the whole thing on. I show that all the time, oh, wow. uh, but all the way, we have to cut it off at around the seventies and from the seventies to currently, you know, is a whole nother two hour program of Mars movies. But uh, as far as that goes, no, I haven't, don't really do much outside of that. Uh, I have, I've talked to the people at the Mars, uh, Mars Rover Challenge about doing some video out there for them. I did video, uh, I was on MDRS crew number two as a journalist. So I went out there with my video gear and I shot up the several EVAs and the habitat life and things going on there. Uh, but other than that, I haven't really done really any Mars related stuff. I okay. still have that, uh, that story that I was doing when I first discovered the Mars Society, you know, I'm not a writer, I'm an occasional writer. So I do, I pull that out and polish it every couple of years, but that story takes place on Mars and the asteroid belts. And uh, it's been basically kind of a DOS boat in space. <laughs> so if you've ever seen that film, it's a German submarine story. But, I, uh, I haven't, I haven't personally, no. Okay. It's, Really, it was one of the films that, that is so visceral. You feel like you're in that clamp submarine, cramp submarine, you're cold, you're wet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing shakes like crazy uh, as you're being bombed and depth charged and stuff like that. 
so I thought, let me take that idea and put it on Mars and around Mars. So uh, that's kind of what the story is there, just in a nutshell. And, uh, but I really like the, the reality of it. It's a the, very hard sci-fi, it sounds like. Very hard sci-fi, uh, very people in a tin can story. You know, they're- what, what era does it take place in? Oh, you're probably talking two, 300 years out. Okay. You know, it's, it's basically an asteroid mining craft that uh, is home based out of Mars. And a war has erupted between Mars and Earth. They've been conscripted into the Martian Space Navy. So they have to do a covert mission. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's really intriguing that way. But uh, I want it to have the reality. You know, I see a lot of video from the International Space Station, and it's all nice and, you know, people dancing around. It never became real to me what was going on at the ISS until I saw Anusha Ansari's talk. And she has a video that she took when she went up to the International Space Station. She spent uh, seven days there. She had video cam a camera with her and she recorded a lot of that. And that stuff became much more real to me than mm -hmm. the stuff we see from the NASA channel. I mean, stuff is floating in the air all the time. You're breathing all this stuff. You know, you, you can put things down and they will stay there or they will slowly start to drift a little bit in the zero gravity. It just made it so real to me. Mm -hmm. I want to try and take this movie and make space visceral for the audience. So that's kind of what's going on that way. I'm still not happy with the story enough to start going out looking for funding and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I have done that in the past where I've taken, you know, as a filmmaker, I've done 16 feature films as the director of photography. Uh, I got most of that hired because I have all the equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, I had the cameras, I had the lights, I had the microphones, I had the, the gear and so forth. But since then and since 2001, I've become an independent contractor. I'm a freelancer, a one-man band band, if you will. One man, yeah, one-man band. Yeah. So I do a little bit of everything. I hire people to help me when I can. Uh, but for the most part... You know, I do corporate and industrial work. Um, a lot of training videos, a lot of uh, document convention lectures, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the last project I did, which I really liked, was a video for uh, the Words Alive Literacy Program. They take a reading program into schools, mm -hmm. elementary schools, junior high, high school, and even adult education. And they get them all excited about that. And, uh, you know, literacy has always been a big thing for me. So I really was involved with a lot of that. But that has been out there now and it's been getting a lot of good feedback. Oh, cool. So I'm really happy with that. All right. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, did we cover everything that you wanted to talk about with regards to the Mars Society San Diego and your movies? Pretty much. Okay. But, you know, I would love to see this thing grow legs again and get going. So, for all you folks out there in the San Diego area, you got to get with Jerry here and yeah. uh, you got to get this thing going, okay? And the best place to reach me is either the, through the MarsMovieGuide.com, my email address is there, mm -hmm. or through the San Diego Space Meetup. San because Diego. the meetup is, a, is, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. <laughs> and uh, basically, I just collect all this San Diego space events, you know, from the San Diego Astronomy Association, from the model rocketry groups, to the uh, space lectures, to the local space breweries that are doing fun stuff. Uh -huh. uh, and I put them together as meetup groups. So we have a lot of stuff going on here that's space related. All right, so. Well, okay. Get in contact with Jerry there, and um, 
Jerry, uh, really, really appreciate you coming on and talking My with pleasure. us. Um, I, I learned oh. quite a bit. I'm also on Twitter at Mars San Diego. Mars San Diego. At Mars yeah. San Diego. At Mars San Diego. There you go. So right. um, that's it for our episode. Thank you again, uh, friends, for watching. Um, if you want to help us out, you know, please hit the like button, subscribe, share, comment. Um, let us know what you think uh, about this new format. I know it's a little bit different. Hopefully, uh, people will like it. We're doing it based on feedback we've gotten. Um, if you want to volunteer, uh, go ahead and go to marstalk.org. There you can also find our latest episodes, uh, social media, and links to everything in this episode as well as all of our others. Um, you can reach me on Twitter <laughs> at architetnid. That's A-R-C-H-I-T-E-C-H-N-I-D. And then you can reach James Burke at James Burke, also on Twitter. And uh, you just heard Jerry tell you how you could reach him as well. Um, now, uh, the Mars Society, our Mars Talk is presented by the Mars Society. Uh, we have it produced by Lucinda Offer, Nora Hovey, James Burke, and myself. We thank you so much for watching, guys, and we will talk to you next <clears throat> week. Bye. Be seeing you. Live long and prosper.